Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Rama podcast. I'm your host Lafarius, and for this week's episode in our 63rd show, we shall be taking a deep dive into Golden Axe. But as usual, before we jump right into that, let's have a look at this week's news. You may not have noticed by now, but you should have done, especially if you follow the show closely at all, we have a brand new logo. Now this is plastered across the website, the Facebook pages, you name it, I'm even using it on the show covers and it's absolutely awesome. And a huge thank you has to go out to Wayne Ashworth for this. Wayne has been doing some amazing work with the Scourge of the Underkind Amiga game, which isn't that far off completion. And he basically stepped forward, offered to redo the logo for me and a few tidbits around the edges and I couldn't be happier it looks absolutely awesome it's even using the official Amiga font and he even went out of his way to redraw the Amiga tick so a huge thank you to Wayne and I will stick a link into his Facebook page into the show notes now something very special was done recently called the AMAG Disc Zine and the reason I'm bringing it up is because they interviewed me and I was quite happy to do it. I've never really done this sort of a thing before and the actual mag itself is effectively a disc magazine of old. Now it was created with something called DMC articles submitted by the general Amiga community as well as members and written up by the team. Now from what the tech specs say it it has been fully tested on a real A1200, 600 and an A500. It's also been successfully fully tested in all sort of emulated Amigas as well. I have read this from cover to cover and it's absolutely amazing. It reads really well and I'm not just talking about my part as well. Some good articles in there. Very interesting. I would well recommend it and I will stick a link into the show notes. They've just announced they are working on a second issue and are looking for contributors. So if you want to get involved and enjoy reading the mag, by all means, drop them a line or comment on the page. Because this sort of thing really needs our help and support. We really need to get the work out there. So if anything, please just share this page or stick it on your Twitter and stuff. Let's get it out there and let's get people seeing it. In our last bit of news, Eroc has just released a brand new CD32 disc. Now, this is packed to the brim with all sorts of games. Pretty much everything that's come out in 2018. So you've got stuff like... Choctris, which is Tetris with chocolate bars in, I'm not entirely sure. Dino Runner, Golden Wing, Kiwi's Tale, which is sort of an unofficial sequel to New Zealand's Tale, I believe. Mini Swat, which is an awesome shooter, I have played it. Santa Chaos, Tiger Claw, Uwol, and Worthy. Quite an awesome collection for CD32 fans, so as usual, I will stick a link into the show notes. Having recently covered Double Dragon and what was a bit of a disaster of a port, I'm sorry to say. I'm not sure if that was down to publisher interference or the coder. In fact, I think it was the bosses upstairs usually forcing something like that out. You know, it wasn't finished or it wasn't fit enough really to be a good version of the arcade game. And of course that sent me down the route of thinking, well, there must be other arcade beat-em-ups like that in the, like, the scrolling genre. And the first one that came to mind was Golden Axe. Now I've always had a bit of a history with this on the old Sega Mega Drive. It's one of the first games that I ever play when I'm testing emulators or getting a system again to grab the odd cartridge and it's one of those games that always stands out in my mind 
and getting the chance to go back and play it on the Amiga was actually quite exciting because it's not a version I've really played. Now this does have quite the reputation, a very popular reputation. I've heard some people saying it's the best scrolling beat em up game on the system. So of course I had to sit down there and scratch my head and think well will it do for an episode and well I hope you like what we're going to cover. And first of all, it was published by Virgin, and they did games like Dan Dare 3 on the Amiga, Judge Dredd, Sport of Kings, Viz, which is a very funny, popular uh, UK rude comedy magazine. Ooh, what a way to spin off there. Wonderland, I don't know what that is. Shinobi, that's a big one. X Days, Axe Stars, I'm not sure, I can't read me on scribbling, etc, etc. They were a huge publisher, they did things like Lion King, Aladdin, all the big sort of movie cartoon tie-ins as well. They were a massive developer in the 16-bit era who sort of just disappeared after that, I'm not sure why. They're still knocking around, I think, by the way. They just don't seem to be as big as they were back in the day. Now, the developer behind this was a company called Dementia, and they just worked on a couple couple of other games, Corporation, I think that's a 3D like Maze Explorer game, no maybe wrong, and Hot Rod which is a very odd mix, I think that must be a racer. This came out in 1990 and it was on one floppy disc, priced at £24.99 at launch, it was for two players. Now it was coded by Richard Costello who had worked on games at such as Terminator 2, that's not a good sign, Primal Rage, oh, not too bad, Motorhead, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, Hot Rod, Gauntlet 2 and Archipelagos. Pelagos, again I'm not sure what the hell that's about, I suspect that's a shooter going off that title, please let me know in the comments. The graphics were done by Adrian Carlos, and he did First Class, Little Devil, he also did Shadow Fighter, Shoe People, that sounds awesome, Space Crusade, which we covered many moons ago, Zool, and Super Ted, which I think is a newer release. Other graphics guy was Kevin Barmer, or Bulmer, he did Galaxy Force 1 and 2, T2, Shadow Sorcerer, Hot Rod again, I'll have to look that up. Corporation, Deflector, Gauntlet 2, etc, etc. He must have done piles and piles of games. And then next up for graphics was Mark Knowles. And he did games like Overlord, Smash TV, Supremacy, Teenage Mutant, Hero Turtles. I don't think the Amiga version is all that bad, but it might be terrible. Anyway, moving on to the music. It was done by David Whittaker. And he'd done tunes on Alfred Chicken... APB, which I think that's an awesome arcade game, Bubble Bobble, Days of Thunder, Dogs of War, Epic, Lemmings 2, etc, etc. Now, as a game, Golden Axe is a straightforward Amiga port. There isn't any sort of interviews or anything in depth. Again, I always try and do some digging and I look back at magazines from the time, but this isn't a big game in the sense that they were pushing the guys behind it. You know, it wasn't like a new brand new IP. They were just bringing it straight across from the arcade game. So they won't have done much in the way of media for it. And there's nothing going on. So sadly, we can only dig into the general history of the Golden Axe game. So please stay with me as we go into it. Originally, the game was designed to run on the Altered Beast System 16 arcade board, and the designers of it actually said that they were inspired by Double Dragon's gameplay to come up with this. Hopefully they did not play the Amiga part of that. Now, that in turn was developed by Makota Yoshida, Yoshida, who felt arcade games should be able to complete against Dragon Quest which, if you haven't heard of it, is a Japanese RPG, top-down RPG, with a bit of action thrown in there. It did massively well on launch and spawned a huge series, mainly in Japan. The rest of the world never really got on with it as a game. And of course, Makota felt that he wanted to do something more like fantasy and... Dungeons and Dragons, so he actually went out of his way to study different types of magic. And that's all like the Dungeon and Dragon element, swords and the weapons. Now, the game as a whole is heavily influenced by high fantasy. 
He also stated that Conan the Barbarian was viewed repeatedly for lots of different styles and themes that are used throughout the game. And I will say this, I say it to many, many people, that is one of my all-time favourite movies, and I'm talking about the director's cut. I'm sure we've mentioned this on the show before, it's very high fantasy, very 80s, and it's awesome, just go and watch it. They did look at Double Dragon's two-player mode, which sort of inspired them to do a three-player version, but sadly that's why there's three characters in there. But hardware limitations meant they were stuck with only two. The arcade game does have an awful lot of, like, digitised screams and little bits of speech dotted throughout. They were actually taken from Conan the Barbarian and First Blood on the Sly with no licensing involved. I'm not sure how they got away from that. The 80s were a very different time. Fighting beat-em-ups of this type are very similar so Yushida went out of his way to include lots of different moves you know not to make the combat as repetitive as these other games and it does actually show while you're playing because you can do things like jump slash swing you know charge bash with uh, mid-air attacks and all that has come across on the Amiga version. Each character, of course, has their own weapon, and that made it much more of a hack and slash than Double Dragon could ever claim to be. The cockatrice enemy, which sort of looked like chickens, were taken from Altered Beast. Now, those, of course, can be ridden, and there's also a dragon in there to stick with the high fantasy theme. Though it only breathes fire out, it doesn't actually fly around. Now, throughout the game, most enemies are human, as they wanted to keep the game more grounded and more man-on-man or man-on-woman combat, because there's some of that in there. So there's very few non-human enemies. You know, you're looking at things like the skeletons, I suppose, but even those, they're human skeletons. They are nothing too fancy. During development, it was actually called Battle Axe. But upon seeing the game, the president of Sega US actually thought that the Dwarf's Axe was gold, and so Golden Axe was born. Now, it went on to be a massive hit in arcades, and when they ported it to numerous systems, they did so well that they decided to do sequels. Now, that did drop off, I think, by the third game. I don't think that appeared on anything else, and I think the Amiga only got the first Golden Axe game. Back in 2008, there was a modern remake, but practically 10 years ago now, it, that might be retro in itself. It sold quite poorly, and it was a terrible version of the game. It just didn't work. They should have stuck to the arcade routes. Now, originally, Golden Axe was ported to the Amstrad CPC, Atari ST, Wonderswan, Commodore 64, Spectrum, Game Boy Advance, PC Engine, Master System, Mega Drive or Genesis, PC DOS, IBM, PC Junior, and take a deep breath before I run out, it went everywhere. It was absolutely massive, and rightly so. So let's have a look into the quest for the Golden Axe. A terrible scourge has settled on the land of Uria. The evil reptilian creature, Death Adder, invaded the peaceful villages and byways of this ancient land, putting the population to the sword and worse. His armies of thugs and other murderous creatures now run amok in Uria, terrifying the innocent citizens and exacting crippling taxes from the people. Food is running low and there is little hope of freedom. The very existence of Yuria is now threatened. Death Adder has kidnapped the king and his daughter, the beautiful princess, and he is holding them captive in their own castle. Death Adder has also found the Golden Axe, the magical emblem of the land of Yuria, and plan to destroy it and kill the royal family, unless all of the people of Yuria bow to his will, swearing an oath of allegiance to his evil regime, accepting him as ruler. There seems to be little chance of defeating Death Adder and ridding Yuria of his evil hordes. The king's armies were crushed long ago in fierce and bloody battles, but an alliance of free warriors from the farthest corners of the land may just manage the impossible. Now, that's not the deepest of high fantasy, but it sort of gets the job done. Now, when you first load the game, it presents a very good rendition, an Amiga rendition of the arcade music and the choice of three characters. 
In fact, the title screen of the game matches the arcade game completely and it's very well done. The three characters are Axe Battler, Gilius Thunderhead and Tyrus Flare or Swordsman, Swordswoman and Dwarf as it's always been in my head. Each of them has a different type of music as well as a weapon which includes things like fire, lightning, volcano so a very close match to the arcade there's not really anything different there and beginning the game you get to see your friend alex wandering towards you and he's hobbling that i'm not know why i'm laughing there but he's hobbling towards you and then one of the game's enemies just come walking up behind him and bashes him round the back of the head and kills the poor guy and he very quickly tells you before he takes his last breath what's happened what's going on and anyway you set out on revenge and you pretty much thrown straight into the action now to the top left of the screen is the stage number a magic bottle bar and that can be used several times of course you have to build that up for more powerful spells and that can be done by beating up the like pixies or maybe sort of leprechauns i'm not entirely sure they appear at different points throughout the stages either in between stages when you're resting by campfires or every so often the level just freezes completely last these things come running on and you bash and kick them around the screen and steal these little bottles from them have the same happens with health as well i don't know why they're carrying around big old legs of turkey or whatever it is it's some kind of meat product to the lower left of the screen is an energy bar which has three hits. You cannot increase that anywhere throughout the game. There's also a counter for three lives. Now this is your typical arcade setup. There's no timer or even a score counter anywhere on screen. You do get to find the score out when you either die or get to the end. Now, the first thing you will notice when you play, especially when comparing this to the arcade, is just how well the graphics have been done everything is really well defined all of the arcade backgrounds the levels the enemies everything's here it makes for a great and interesting high fantasy world to explore it's almost like something out of lord of the rings and it's very very strongly conan the barbarian it gets that feel just right and it's spot on and it's probably as good as the Amiga could do compared to an arcade port and it really has come across well. Now the controls are quite basic as it's just one button game, holding a direction then tapping or holding fire will let you attack, move off in a direction. You do get the chance to do quite a lot of complicated moves, things like a pile drive, that's like jumping in the air and slashing down or swinging your ref weapon off in a different direction. It does a very good job of bringing the whole arcade controls across onto a single button and a single stick and it feels very fluid, especially to move around the screen and to combat and hit the enemies. It's also very easy to charge across the screen. I'm glad they brought that across. You just double tap and you'll go, running off or she will go running off in any direction the magic is very easy to use you just tap one of the alt keys on your keyboard or if you're like me and you use an emulator you can program one of them to the second key press and it just works as well in fact i prefer doing that as it's much easier just to focus entirely on the control pad the magic doesn't take over, you're not using it constantly throughout the levels. It's often a good idea to build it up towards the big boss at the end of each stage. You can use it a couple of times throughout, but it's always a good idea to keep saving the bottles because the more bottles you have, the more powerful the spell is that you are using. Now, when you use this, of course, it freezes the screen and it's usually like some sort of special effects like loads of lightning flashing around or fireballs and volcanoes even a dragon i think swoops down and breathes a load of fire everywhere they all have some very interesting effects and as far as i could tell everything has been brought across from the arcade all of the arcade stages have been brought across there's four in total which are broken up slightly with a few obstacles throughout it might be simple things like jumping from one section of an island to another 
you start off in the woods and then you go on to Turtle Village and you actually get to see the face of the turtle. Eagle Island, you get to see that as well. Yeah, you get to walk across an actual eagle. It's great. And finally, Death Adder's Castle. Everything's here. The full arcade experience. Nothing's been cut or shortened. You do have an option to steal and ride mounts throughout the game. They range from the chicken creature I mentioned before. I can't even remember what it was called. It's always a chicken in my mind. And then you've got the things like the, the rideable flame breathing dragon. That's quite neat, especially when you charge because it like headbutts everybody on the screen in a line. They do make you feel quite powerful compared to when you're just wandering around on the floor. And it can often be a case that you get one of these mounts and keep it for the entirety of a level. It's often a very good idea because some of the enemies can be quite tough. It's not as limited as Double Dragon with just a couple of enemies there. There are several always dotted around and they're always quite different types as well. There's not too many of them but there's enough that there's a difference in combat and styles whilst you're wandering around. I did forget to say that riding the mounts, you get them by knocking people off them, but they can also do the same to you. And when you do get knocked down, it's often a case of you have to either scramble to get back up quickly because they might steal your mount and then come to attack you on it. So poor old little Jeffrey or Derek that you've been riding on for the last 10 minutes might suddenly turn on you and start breathing fire on you. It's very, very upsetting. It can be very easy to be knocked off in a group of enemies when they surround you and when that happens it's always a good idea to back off as quickly as possible, maybe get enough distance where you can charge back in or even use the magic. I am happy to say that all of the arcade enemies have come across, you've got things like the brutes, soldiers, skeletons, the female warriors, but the game doesn't really add anything new to the actual enemies and it's quite a limited selection really again it's better than double dragon and it does match what's in the arcade though i would have liked to have seen a few more of them now i'm afraid to say there's not much of a learning curve with this as all the levels are similar and they play the same you know it's just a scrolling beat and what what you're doing in level one is the same as what you're doing in the last level that really doesn't change much beyond the odd bit of walking around to explore the levels as, as you're moving from a to b again that's not so much it's this huge fantasy world you get to explore there's not these branching paths but there's a few sections where you can go up or down depending on a lower or higher part of the level and it just makes it a little bit more interesting I'm happy to say that the arcade music has been redone throughout using Amiga tones. It's not like completely sampled off the original arcade and it sounds fantastic. It's even better in my opinion than the actual arcade cab and I did play them side by side and had a, a good listen. It doesn't even appear to be missing any of the classic sound effects. This is as good as you can get with sound on the Amiga and I'm very happy to say that each of the levels have like the full spread of music and there's all the bashing and rolling and the crunching and everything that you would want from this sort of a game. I was very, very happy with it. Before we get too excited though, let's just have a look at some of the game's problems. First of all, there's just not much to it. Although it's a straight arcade port, it could have done with a lot more. You know, it really would have benefited with a few more levels. It just means it won't last you very long at all. Even on my first attempt, and I'm pretty terrible at games, I almost completed it. I got right to the end. There's not really any challenge in there. There's no sort of option to change that either. It does have some very strange disc loading. Probably not something everyone will be interested in, but often through part of the levels when you're playing, it will just pause and do some loading. Now, this is crying out for a decent difficulty option. As I said, there's just nothing there. There's not even any continues, and you think, oh, that's got to be a challenge. But even without continues, you don't really need them because you've got more than enough lives. I didn't see that you could get any more lives as you were collecting points along the way. And there's definitely not any sort of like icon to collect or anything. So that's a bit disappointing on the old difficulty. 
although the graphics do match the arcade quite well when i was looking at them they did seem to be a little bit squished and someone might be thinking oh that must be the way you've got your screen set no it's odd it's just how they're designed and drawn i think on the screen i've tried it on me a1200 and also tried it on an emulator it always looks the same it's like they've not stretched it up enough i'm not entirely sure how to describe it though it did stand out to me on the very first play and it's just something that stuck in my mind you mean you probably won't notice it might just be me being crazy now magic is on the keyboard and i wish they could have made it be a couple of joystick moves like say something like hold down fire tap up down up or something just to fire that then again when you're running around and getting in the middle of a brawl you'd probably set the magic off by accident though Maybe I'm just being lazy, you can reach across to that keyboard or reprogram it on an emulator. Now it's a bit basic when it comes to the combat, it's more complicated than a Double Dragon I suppose, it's an early sort of arcade beat em up, though it does feel like they could have improved that slightly and expanded the combat and the moves out to something else. Though. Maybe it's best not to mess too much with classic gameplay, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, two minds about that. They could have maybe added an option in to change control schemes or done something a bit better. Maybe had like an arcade mode or a challenge mode. There's just nothing like that. In fact, that would have been a very good way to expand the game as a whole. So let's have a look at the magazine scores. CVG gave it 90%. The one, 90% as well, then it drops a fair chunk to 80% for Amiga format. See you Amiga, 78%. Amiga action, 74%. My god, the real are dropping now. And then the worst would be Amiga power at 35% on a re-release. It's certainly not that level of awful. Behave yourselves, guys. And yes, I know that reviews are a person's opinion, and that goes for me as well, I suppose. Anyway, that's a strange mix of magazine scores. You know, most really appreciate it as an arcade port, and then they tended to pick at the similar points I'd mentioned. The difficulty was always up there, and the lack of like any reason to replay this, because beyond completing it, there's nothing else to do. It's not like, say, Smash tv or r type or any other type of game where there's always a challenge to come back because there's a, a higher level of difficulty once you've gone through this it'll probably end up stuck back in the disc box for ages and even though that sounds a bit down i do think that this is just how an arcade port should be done. They've done an amazing job bringing this all the way across and it makes me laugh now even more just looking over at that double dragon port and just what could have been done with that. The difficulty in it of course is its biggest problem and at least the two player mode expands the fun a little bit more. You can also try that over on Amiga Live. Now they should have extended it though with more levels and up the combat a bit and added some more options in there which is a shame now on release this was a massive hit it reached number two in the uk xmas sales charts and i do wonder if the developer had wished they'd done more now despite its problems this is as good as it gets for arcade ports they got everything right and it's really quite impressive i absolutely love the music it's as good as you can get it now just a few more tweaks though and it really would have deserved those 90 percent scores that some of the mags were throwing at it i'm not sure why they were so excited at the time i suspect with it being a magazine reviews they were probably playing the two-player game with uh, other people in the office and got a bit carried away so overall i'd say this is it's an amiga armor try and see award what an odd thing to say i really liked it there's only a little bit there though to enjoy it's a very good version of the arcade game but it's too short and it just needs that a little bit more to be a true great do need to take a moment to send out a huge thank you to Dan from Lemon Tube Amiga. Probably getting quite used to him popping up by now. He spent a great deal of time with me, helping me to learn and play through Golden Axe, and you'll be able to see that in our YouTube footage. And that sadly brings us to the end of another show. And as always, I would like to send out a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. Without them, a lot of this show would not be possible. They are Adam Bradley... Darren Coles, Figgy CTZ, Graham Vebke, 
Glenn Milford from Casual Retro Gamer Weekly, Jason Warns, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Retro Ravi, Richard Legg, Sneff and Treble. Just remember, if you'd like to help the show out as well, you can pop along to patreon.com slash Amigarama. Finally, if you have any comments about the show or anything I've said today, you can pop along to facebook.com slash Amigarama, follow me on Twitter at AmigaramaPod, or even drop the show an email, which is lefarious at Amigarama.com. Until next time, guys.